What's up, meatbag? So today we're talking about the lats, and my goal for this video is to make it the best video on the internet when it comes to total lat training. And that's a very big, ambitious goal, and this video will not be five minutes. I can tell it's going to be much longer, but if you stick around to the end, you should have a much much better idea about how to optimally train your lats. So we're going to go into exercises, we're going to go into rep ranges, we're going to go into anatomy, technique, other muscles, uh, how to optimally train the lats for hypertrophy. First, let's talk about anatomy because even though it's a little bit boring, I think it is really important. It can actually help you get better results. So the lat connects uh, alongside the spine, even down into the hip and it connects up into the upper arm. And it is responsible for shoulder extension. So this is when your shoulder, your arm is above you, and it is being brought down back alongside the body, and then perhaps even behind the body as well. So the lats are gonna be trained by anything that does this motion. So it could be a pull up, could be a pull down, could be a pull over, could be, you notice a, a, a trend here, pull. Uh, could be a row, could be a deadlift, but all of these are going to be working the lat. Now, the lats are one area that a lot of people have trouble feeling. They have trouble actually feeling that area work. It's not like the quads. It's not like, you know, the triceps or the biceps that might have trouble activating the lats. Other muscles can take over. And so I think it's important for a lot of people to try to get proper lat activation before they train. A whole lot of people in their whole damn life have never felt their lat contract. So doing something like a one arm cable row, I think can be very, very useful. I'll, I'll put it on the screen and you're trying to crunch down with your torso at the same time as you are rowing. So make sure you stretch out, get a full stretch and then bring it back and get a really tight contraction at the end, okay? This might take a lot of practice, but it is a great investment for your back training. If you can't feel your lats with this movement, you're probably not gonna get, get good results just because you're not gonna be able to activate them fully with other exercises. Now, for me, the number one exercise to train the lats is going to be the neutral grip and underhand pull-up. So chin-ups and neutral grip pull-ups. Uh, these are both excellent exercises and they do train the lat through a full range of motion. Uh, the trouble with wider grip work is that there's a reduced range of motion and it tends to shift the stress to the teres major. I did a whole video, I will link it up above, um, but the teres major, it is similar to the lat, it's near the lat, it has a similar function to the lat, but with wide grip work, it's not gonna be working the lat as much. It's gonna shift the stress to that sort of upper part of the back. It's a different muscle, has a lot of overlapping function functions, but it's different. Now for pull-ups, I think a lot of people get them wrong or they don't use full range of motion. I think it's important to use full range of motion and also focus on how you are doing them. If you're doing pull-ups like this, the lat is barely going to be active, okay? You want to really keep your chest proud and try to pull your chest to the bar. You might fail, especially as you're going closer to failure and you're getting fatigued, but I think that intent of bringing the arm down instead of like really uh, shrugging up and putting the stress to the traps, I think that is crucial. I think you have to focus on what you're doing, um, even if it means reducing the weight. Ideally, you are adding weight to your pull-ups, but if you can't do them with correct form, you haven't earned that right yet. If you are in quarantine, if you're at home, you can still do weighted pull-ups if you're at that level. Uh, just fill a bag full of stuff, put the bag on your body, then do pull-ups. Boom, weighted pull-ups. Number two is gonna be the Yates Row. Now this is one exercise that it needs to be done correctly, otherwise it is basically useless for lat development. So a few things to keep in mind. Yes, I'm actually about to move for the first time on video. I can, in fact, move. I am not a, uh, I'm not in a wheelchair here. I can actually stand up. All right, so for a Yates row, you're gonna want to target the lats, not the traps, if you are interested in lat development. So if you're using an overhand grip, that is gonna tend to be more traps, okay? I'm not feeling any kind of lat involvement with this type of motion. You want to externally rotate and you want to be pulling 
down and back. Again, shoulder extension, so you want to be focusing on this. If you are shrugging up, you are taking the tension off of the lat. So if you are trap dominant, as I am, you're going to have to focus on actually using the lats. Another thing is to tuck your elbows. If you are letting your elbows flare out, you're probably shrugging up and the tension is going to, going to go more to the rear delts and not the lats. So keep your chest up and focus on pulling back and tucking your elbows. This is going to be much more lats than the way most people do it. So uh, I think it's important to get the technique right. And if you do it right, you can great, get great dividends from doing this movement. I also did a, a whole video, so I will link that up in, the, in, the, uh, in a card up above as well. Number three is going to be pull downs. Now, these are very, very similar to pull ups. It's a very similar motion. The only difference is obviously in one, you're pulling yourself up. The other, you're pulling something down. But I think in terms of technique, in terms of activation, they are very, very similar. Uh, if you had to choose one, I would go for pull ups just because you're also working your core. It's actually a very, very good rectus abdominis core exercise. So I think that is a sort of two birds with one stone type of situation. And, um, but they are both good. They are a little bit different feeling. And so, you know, see which one uh, works for you and incorporate both in your training if you want to. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that range of motion. I see a lot of people, you know, stopping here when you can maybe go a little bit farther. Again, there's nothing wrong with here, but you might get more out of the exercise by reducing the weight a little bit and by using a full range of motion and really focusing on keeping the chest up and doing a strict type of rep. Uh, you can also use neutral grip. You can use overhand, but again, overhand is going to be uh, shifting the tension more towards the teres major, which is a different muscle group. It's also worth noting that wider grip work is often harder on the shoulders and harder on the rotator cuff. Uh, if you've ever had a rotator cuff issue, you'll know that this type of stuff is usually okay, but this can be very, very difficult um, and can actually cause pain. So if you have any kind of like shoulder pain or shoulder issues or rotator cuff issues, I would say either stick to neutral grip or underhand work for a lot of your vertical pulls and probably for your rows as well. The next one is going to be all kinds of deadlifts. So this could be deficit deadlifts. This could be rack pulls. This could be Romanian deadlifts. Uh, I find that all of these work a lot of lat. Now, I know some people are like, no, it's a hamstring and glute exercise. No, I mean, it is, but not entirely those. Other muscles are absolutely going to be active as well, including the spinal erectors, the traps, the lats, the forearms, the grip, even the long head of the triceps in order to extend the shoulder. Again, when you are deadlifting, even just a rack pull, you're in this position and then you're finishing here. So look at the shoulder. Look what is happening at the shoulder joint. Okay, so it's, a, it's actually activating the lats and the long head of the tricep and the rear delt in order to get this type of motion. Um, and this isn't a bad thing, it's just how the body works with a hinging type of movement. If there's weight in your hands, you actually want the lats to be active for two reasons. First, because it's safer, because if your lats are not active, the bar is gonna drift forward away from you, which puts stress on the lower back, which can cause injury. Two, you can just lift more weight, okay? There's no negative to having your lats active in the deadlift. It's actually a pretty decent deadlift builder. It's not like it's the prime mover, but it is definitely active, and I have had sore lats after deadlifting. So it definitely works that area, and that's not a bad thing. Next one is gonna be a pullover. So a pullover, again, it's gonna be working shoulder extension, but it's only really gonna be working half of the range of motion. There's a lot of tension here, a little bit of tension here, and zero tension here, and you can't exactly go forward because that is working the front of the shoulder and not the lat because of just how gravity is acting. Um, so this isn't a bad exercise, it's just sort of only a partial range of motion exercise. Uh, you can get a big stretch. It's good for your mobility. Uh, I think it's a great exercise, but you definitely need other movements as well to work the full range of motion. So, you know, pair it with a row, get the, the contracted side, get the stretch side, and that should be completely okay. Uh, I did a full video. I will link it up there as well. The next one sort of solves that, a standing cable pullover. So this is where you have a cable set up 
and you can get actually get a full stretch, but then also a full contraction. And this is basically working the shoulder through the entire range of motion. So when you're doing a pull up, there's really not that much tension at the top. There's a decent amount of tension here. And then again, here, you can just sort of hang out here. So there's not really a lot of tension, but with a standing cable pullover, your arms are fairly straight and you can really work the entire range of motion very, very effectively. Again, I did a uh, video on that before and I will link it up above. Next up, we have cable rows. So I haven't been able to do these for a while and it requires a specific setup. You can do them in a typical like cable crossover machine, but often these aren't heavy enough just because you know you can row far more than what is on the stack. Um, but I think if you're doing high reps and if you're really pushing the entire set, you can definitely get a lot out of this. You can play around with your torso position. Uh, if you're lean back, if you're lean forward a little bit, how much of a stretch do you get uh, in that far range of motion? And again, you want to pull down. So keep your chest up, keep your palms up as well, and then pull down. So you're not pulling to your chest, you're pulling down to around your belly button. And this is going to be what gets more lat activation because you're focused on that end range of motion of shoulder extension. So you're not like shrugging back or, or like a face pull or anything like this. You are focused on pulling downwards and getting as much lat activation as you can. And this is one movement where I think you actually probably don't need heavy weight. Uh, I'm only using 35 kilos in this video and it is very, very challenging because I'm actually focusing on squeezing down with the lats and actually getting as much out of light weight as I can. Again, how you do a movement is more important than the actual name of the movement itself. If you're not using your lats, the tension is easily going to go somewhere else. It'll go to your spinal erectors, it'll go to your traps, it'll go to your biceps, it'll go to your rhomboids, it'll go to your forearms, it'll go to your ass, it'll go everywhere. It'll go everywhere but the area that you want to target. And this is especially true if you do not have good genetics for lats. For me, I don't have good genetics for my lats and therefore I really do need to focus on what I'm doing in order to put tension there. My traps, my biceps are both very happy to steal all of that juicy tension. Therefore, it just requires mind over matter in order to get the results that I want. It's just how things are. Training isn't always easy. That's a reality of life. If you're at home, I think uh, inverted rows can be a good way to get lat development. Pull-ups are still going to be king, but doing some kind of like TRX row, again, where you're pulling low, you're pulling with your elbows tucked, you're trying to avoid biceps and tra traps activation, I think can be really good. So if you're at home, you can still develop some bomb ass lats. You just have to focus on doing the movement right and getting that tension to where you want it to go. Next up, we have the T-bar row. So I typically feel these in a mix between my traps and my lats. Again, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but you're going to want to tuck the elbows, keep the chest up, and really focus on putting that tension into the lats. And, you know, this can be a really good way to overload. I would keep the, the movement pretty strict. I've definitely cheated a lot in the past. Maybe I'll put a video on here of me fucking bawling out on T-bar rows like an idiot. Um, you know, I think that type of rowing can still get you good results. I think it, it translates over to a deadlift more. You're getting, uh, you know, quad activation and, and hamstrings and glutes and spinal erectors and all kinds of stuff is just firing to get the weight moving. But if you want to specifically target the lats, you're better off probably cutting the weight in half. Yes, half and doing the movement a little bit more strictly. And, you know, this can be a huge uh, ego destruction just because you're going to have to reduce the weight by a lot. I've seen some people rowing, even clients, and I just told them like, all right, back to the pink dumbbells, buddy. Um, just because they're rowing and it's like fucking, it's everywhere but the lats, but the area they want to develop. And I think, you know, whether it's a T-bar row, a one-arm row, uh, a Yates row, just a normal barbell row. Uh, I do think this is one movement, you know, one area where reducing the weight can actually be very useful, at least in the short term. And then you can build back up with the correct technique that is focusing more on the lats. Finally, there are some other movements that I think can actually be good. I just haven't used that much myself in my training. One arm rows, 
Meadows Rows, uh, pullover machines, an old school machine where it's actually uh, a pretty constant resistance curve. I think those can be really, really good. Um, machine rows, hammer strength rows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think those can all be good and it's sort of a matter of personal preference. But generally speaking, those tips of pulling down, keeping the chest up, and then focusing on the lats is going to be pretty universal. If you're rowing like this, no matter what anyone says, that's mostly rear delts and traps, not lats. So if you keep those in mind, they should apply to just about any type of row. Now, in terms of programming, I would say they respond better to higher reps, decently high frequency, and then higher volume as well. Uh, yes, you can tear a lat, but it is very rare, and it's not like tearing your pec or tearing your biceps. Uh, if you tear a lat, something was really weird. Maybe some kind of like uh, deadlift accident or something. I don't know. Um, I've heard of it happen, but it's extremely rare. And the lats can take a whole lot of punishment. Um, you know, they connect over such a wide area in the spine that they are very, very resilient. And I think for most people, they really can attack the lats with a lot of intensity, a lot of um, close to failure work, a lot of higher rep stuff and recover just fine. Whereas, you know, a chest or, or uh, a biceps or a triceps or something or hamstrings might not survive that kind of onslaught. So I would say higher volume is generally going to be best. In terms of rep range, I would say for most vertical pulls, 8 to 15, somewhere in there. On weighted pull-ups, you can go a little bit heavier, perhaps 3 to 5, occasionally 1 to 2, should be okay. For most rowing variations, higher reps, absolutely. And this is because they are more cheatable, clearly, um, and because they have a shorter range of motion. So because the range of motion is essentially half or less, compared to a vertical pull, you can do higher reps and it's going to be more optimal to do higher reps. So for most rowing variations, I would say anywhere from 10 to 15, and then maybe even 15 to 20 is going to be good. Uh, but it sort of depends if you're rowing from the floor or you're doing more of a Yates style row and how much range of motion are you using. Um, so you can use a variety, of, but I would say typically 10 to 20 is going to be ideal maybe occasionally going five to 10. In terms of a mind-muscle connection, I do think this is a little bit more important than some other areas. Again, there are other areas that can steal the tension, as I have said about 18 times already in this video. So if after a back day, your traps are hella sore, your biceps are hella sore, uh, maybe your lower back is just beat to hell, and you feel nothing around your armpit, like this area is just not sore at all, there's like nothing happened, well then nothing happened, okay? Like nothing happened to that area because you were training incorrectly. So I think incorporating some of these tips, techniques, strategies can actually get you better results as well as pre-activation and really focusing on the area that you want to target. In terms of injury concerns, I would say the lat itself is, is rarely gonna have any issues, uh, the shoulder itself as well. Uh, maybe with wider grip stuff, but for, for lower grip, probably not. Um, the most common issues are going to be wrist pain. If you're doing like narrow grip stuff and you don't have a lot of range of motion in terms of uh, rotation. Um, elbows as well for a lot of people, uh, especially if you're doing, you know, overhand and then underhand. I would say neutral grip is most comfortable for most people. Uh, if you're at home, you can just buy one of those neutral grip attachments and then, you know, go to up, go up to a damn tree and then, you know, chuck it over there and, and do neutral grip pull downs or pull ups. I've done that before. Um, it can work pretty well, but typically speaking, neutral grip is best. Underhand is okay, but you might be careful with the full extension. Like if you're in a classroom and you raise your hand, are you going to raise it like this? Like, who does that? You might raise it like this, because it's a more natural position when you're overhead. Maybe like this, it's okay. But trying to, <laughs> I can't even do it with no weight. And so when you have a lot of weight pulling you into this unnatural position, it puts, it puts a lot of stress on the elbow, and then potentially the wrist as well, and maybe the shoulder, but probably up here. And it's just a very unnatural position to be in. And I would say try the best you can to use neutral grip. It's just going to be better in almost every way. 
The one exception would be if you have any kind of like brachialis issue where it's going to be more active with this type of grip or with a neutral grip and less active with an underhand chin up style of grip. So um, most people, if they do a ton of volume, they will break down somewhere in the kinetic chain. Um, you just have to find out where that is for you and then avoid doing stuff that messes up that area. Now, all of that being said, progressive overload is still the name of the game. And if you see someone who can do like 15 strict neutral grip pull-ups in a row with full range of motion, the odds of them having small lats is very, very small. And typically, if I see someone with lagging lats, it's just because they're not strong enough. Okay, I think you can maybe activate certain areas better with some of the techniques that I've talked about but you're still gonna have to get stronger. If you can't do a single pull-up yet, you know, just do that, okay? Just focus on getting to your first pull-up before worrying about the things in this video. Uh, I think keeping your training as simple as possible, as long as possible, I know that's hard if you consume YouTube fitness content, I think that's gonna be the way to go. Just keep it simple and try to progressively overload as best you can, and that's gonna be what provides the bulk of your results. Uh, in terms of volume, I would say you can get away with quite a bit. In a specialization program where you wanna bring up your lats for advanced trainees, I have 16 to 30 sets for pull movements. So obviously that is a lot of volume, but I think it's doable. You know, if you're doing pull downs, you know, obviously if you're doing like really hardcore sets, uh, it's gonna be lower than that. But I think with like typical two to four reps in reserve sets, you can do quite a bit of volume for the lats and they can recover pretty well. Uh, I think they tend to be more slow twitch for what it's worth and um, they do recover quite a bit more quickly than some other muscle groups. So I think taking a volume-based approach is probably a good idea. Uh, you know, try it out, see if it works. Volume is gonna be fairly individual. So I think it's important to experiment with your training. By no means am I saying like, go do 30 sets per week for your lats. Um, you know, maybe start 15, somewhere around there, and then either scale up or scale down based on how you feel. Finally, two things. First, genetics, they are very important for the lats. Some people just have a lat that connects very high into the arm. They connect very like far up and far out here, and their genetic potential for growth is just higher. And then they also connect very low down into the hip, and therefore their potential for growth is just higher. Just the reality of it, some people have better lat genetics, and it's a very important muscle group for bodybuilding, so most top bodybuilders have pretty good lat insertions. Not all of them, but most of them. Second of all, patience. After two or three years of training, almost no one has impressive lats. Some people have impressive arms, some people have an impressive chest or calves or whatever, but almost no one has impressive looking lats. So I do think they are an area that takes a while to sort of uh, connect with and to develop and to really build up. So if you've only been training like two or three years, just have patience and keep going. These strategies in this video should help a lot. Best of luck to you. Make sure to like the video. That is all for today. Subscribe to the channel. Notifications on. Share on social media. Pet a cat. All kinds of good stuff. And I will see you in the next video. Peace.